Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Thinking Through Making. This is a podcast series where I interview other makers about their life and work. Today we are going to be talking to Willie Smith. Willie is a knitting teacher, I guess you could call him a knitting influencer maybe? Um, but most of all he spreads hope and joy about knitting all over the internet. And we're going to be talking to him about his creative processes and productivity and also about the Galway sheep breed and because he has a keen interest in the history, the lore and of course the yarn of that as well. And that's because this is going to be launching in my shop as well on St. Patrick's Day. So I thought you might be interested in some of the chat that we had about it. So thanks for joining us and here we go. Hi Willie, thanks for joining me on the Thinking Through Making podcast. Um, so <laughs> um, do you want to just go on ahead and tell us a bit about yourself and how you got started with knitting and crafting and a wee bit of your story? Okay, great. Um, my name is Willie Smith, aka Willie Nilly Knits. You already know how I go. Um, I am uh, 37 years old. I am a father of three. Um, I'm married, been married, uh, we just celebrated nine years married not too long ago, so that's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm a full-time manager, dad, husband, brother, you know, knitting influencer, right? And, um, one day I'm going to end up doing this for a living and um, I'm really excited about that. So the way that I got started knitting was, uh, college back in 2007. So I'm kind of like dating myself. I already said my age, forget it. It doesn't matter. Um, but, um, back in 2007, I was, uh, in a class and one of my classmates was knitting. And she was making a, a scarf and it had like the skull and crossbones and like a pink background. I later learned that was intarsia. So mm -hmm. that was pretty sweet. And, uh, I begged her. I was like, you got to show me how to do that. You got, I, I must know. And she probably thought it was some kind of like strange pickup line because, you know, look at me. Like, do I look like someone in the, the space of, of, of learning how to do fiber arts in college to a, you know, talking to a girl. It, it just, it just had the inner workings of like this being like a weird pickup line. And like, I, in hindsight, I kind of see that, but I was enamored. I was like, I need to know please show me. And she didn't show me for a long time. <laughs> and uh, so she finally like broke and gave in and um, she took me to her dorm room and um, showed me how to you know, knit, cast on and uh, purl after she told me to go to like the local like a uh, big box store and get some straight needles and this red hard yarn, you know, that's where everybody started. So um, I mean, that's at least where I started. And uh, she showed me how to do that. And like, she was like so freaked out. She didn't even show me how to bind off. So, I didn't even <laughs> bind off. so um, that whole summer in 07, like that's, that's what I did in the heat of California. Like that's, I, I was knitting, I was working on something. Cause as soon as I had that stuff in my hands, I, I knew I could do something with it. And, you know, fast forward, you know, 16 years later <laughs> uh, and some change later. And, you know, here we are, you and me. Yeah. That's really interesting. So we both learned to knit at uni, but it wasn't our degree. No, I was in a sociology degree. I had a, a you know, we, we, they called it race and ethnic studies, but you know, in the umbrella of sociology, like that's what it was. I wanted to be a teacher, um, a math teacher. So the majors kind of didn't match up, but I thought I could just make my own way and like, you know, carve my own path and pioneer it and uh, get there my own way. And, um, didn't turn out that uh worked out so well, but I'll take where I am right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so how did you go from um learning how to knit from your classmate to like where you are now? Because obviously you're like a knitting teacher, you're like a knitting influencer, designer. So like how did you go from there? I know you said it was 16 years, but like what was that path from where you learned that to where you are now? Okay, great question. So me starting out being a teacher, being a math teacher, like math is in everything that we do. Math is, is life, basically. It's, it's everything. And I'm always interested in trying to figure out some kind of medium that is going to help our youth, because I was really into the, um, still am into the kids and uh, helping kids, you know, realize their potential to do great things. And some people learn better tactile, like with tactile, like very, 
with their hands and with their bodies and feeling and experiencing. So there's more than one, more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to learn a problem and a concept. So when I learned how to knit, I incorporated that into like, you know, my passion for teaching in math and, you know, did after school programs, you know, did classes with folks, just just trying to get people, get kids to spark their their sense of wonder and their sense of imagination. So going along with that and doing all of that, it later I started getting more skills. I started to get better. I, my, my horizon started expanding and getting bigger. And I started to be able to see stuff. So I'm starting to make uh, you know more complex things and um working on hats because I, I love hats. But making hats was like everything. They're fast and it's a good accessory. It can make any outfit like pop and you know, um it was just a style, my style, definitely. And uh my wife's friend, um, longtime friend, uh see me on uh, social media, I think it was like Facebook or something. And she was seeing at the hats, like, oh, those are very, those are very nice hats. How much? And that's when it all changed right there. Like, I realized that, you know, someone was looking at my, my makes and they were good enough to be sold and, uh, you know, in exchange for money, <laughs> which was cool. Not like more yarn or anything. So that's when it really all started. And I uh, started getting into social media. So, you know, August 9th, uh, October 19th, 2019, that's when Willie Nilly Knits started, um, the, the page on Instagram. The business came later. And uh, that's where I was I was at and starting to see social media and then just seeing all of the, the feedback and the quickness of response time and reaction really propelled me to see what else was out there and see other types of uh, potentials and avenues and that's how I got here. And then there was just like the big blow up. Um, I, I'll never forget it. You know, December, last week of December, last two weeks of December in 2022. It, um, I mean, it took me from 2019 to 2022 or something like that to get from zero to like 5,000 followers. And I don't even like calling them followers, but like for Instagram's sake, we just call them followers. I call them my, my people, my audience, things like that. But it went from 5,000 to like 50,000. I was like, what happened? What happened? So what did mm -hmm. happen? <laughs> I, I still don't know to this day. I think it was just like, I must have caught like the algorithm or something or somebody that was famous shared something and just off it went. It was like 50, 55, 65, 85, 105. It was like a ticker for like watching sports, like a highlight reel. And it was just going up by the day. Like my, all my people that like I've, you know, made friends with in social media, you know, my circle, they're like, you're at this now, you're at this now. Oh my goodness, this is crazy. Da, 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 da. And I'm just like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because, you know, I didn't get into social media for the follower count or for the, the internet fame, or I, I didn't get in it for that. I got in it for being able to teach people and, and help inspire people. And if that's working, then we are gonna keep that going because it's serving yeah. my purpose as well. So that's how it, that's how we got here. That's amazing. That's such a crazy like kind of story, like the Instagram thing. Um, yeah. Was it like one particular reel that like went viral at one point, or like? I want to say, oh my goodness, I I want to say it was either the double knitting um video or some other uh, video that I did. I don't know exactly which one, but if we're talking like viral videos, right? Um, that's the one that's like uh, nearly 3 million plays right now, 3 million. And uh, I got another one uh, that's like almost 2 million, but like just thinking about the double knitting one, I think that was the one that really did it. And it was, it was monumental. That's the one that really catapulted me into the stratosphere. So a lot of people wanted to learn that at that particular moment basically so that's yes cool. yeah. that's exactly what's going on because like there's 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 lots of double knitting things um there's a couple of like accounts on instagram that's like really big on um double knitting it's just that it's not very accessible i think it's behind a paywall right mm -hmm. like join this class to learn double knitting is but it's not like oh here's a tutorial that's 90 seconds that shows you everything that you need to know about this particular way to do double knitting 22 stitches across and you can see everything that's going on. And um, 
but I, and, and I made that free. I'm not going to put that behind the paywall because it's skill set. Like that's what I'm here for to teach you, not to sell you knowledge. You know, I, I'd much rather, you know, sell hope <laughs> and potential, you know what I mean? Because like, that's what people will pay for, but um, knowledge should be free. Yeah. That's why you're such a good teacher then, obviously. <laughs> I can I'm Thank really you. getting the yeah those vibes from you like I come from a family of well not my family but my husband's family there's a lot of teachers in it and I think they're all really good teachers and yeah they would probably say the same thing as you like they want to like inspire people and help people and yeah <clears throat> that's really cool so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have three kids so <clears throat> at this point we are recording on a Saturday morning. It is mm -hmm. currently about 5 a.m. your time. Is That's that right? correct. That's okay. correct. So I'm really interested in that intentionality. So why are you getting up at this time? Is this a regular thing? Is there something you get from getting up at this time? I'm really intrigued to know why you get up at this time. Like, is there something special about this time in the morning for you as a maker like yeah give us the juice on that <laughs> no problem well if you have three kids and you know you you want to record a video when you start hearing them in the background it's kind of not the most professional thing so you know getting up in the wee hours of the night is really the only time i really have to not necessarily unwind but to actually work mm -hmm. um so like working third shift and doing those kinds of things, you 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 kind of get you, you never get unused to getting up at, you know, 11 when everybody's supposed to be still asleep and then working until the wee hours of the night. So like 11, 8, 11 p.m. to like 3 a.m. is um, not necessarily a usual because, you know, we're all human. We can't run like that. And I, I already work like 60 hours a week um, at my um, day job. So um, especially on Saturdays and Sundays and um Sunday, Monday is when I have um off. So those are the days I do damage. So I, I'd say about one time a month, I'll pull an all-nighter. And it'll probably be like Sunday to Monday. It'll just be like, I'm up and I'm up 24 hours plus. Just getting things done, just trying to be productive. Like I got this cool little timer. It helps me be productive. Let's me know how much time I'm spending on things, you know, because I, I need those kinds of things. I really compartmentalize. But getting up at this time is, you know, the time where I make these things happen. And I always like say, I, I joke with my friends and my, my wife, like, while you guys are sleeping, I'm working on the dream. <laughs> so <laughs> keep sleeping. That's really interesting because like for me, I would be like, that feels like the middle of the night. And my little girl, I have a two year old and she's still mm. going through a phase of getting up like two, three in the morning. I could not contemplate getting up at that time. Like, I, like, do your kids get up in the night? Because to me, like, if I started recording, I'd probably be more likely to get interrupted during the night than during the day. <laughs> right, for sure. Um, they don't get up very much anymore because all my kids are small. Like, um, my oldest is seven. My middle child is uh three. Should be four next month, and my baby baby is like nine months. Oh, so nice. we've we've definitely gone through the time and just trying to figure out strategize how we can still get these things done because you know my wife is very supportive of me shout out to her like there'd be no willy nilly nits without my wife alicia um she's we we sat down and we've strategized and tried to figure out what's the the best case scenario like this like last night like just me coming home after like you know a 10 11 hour day and hitting the ground running, taking the kids to the mall, you know, spending some time with them, coming back, cleaning up the house. Like I haven't sat down ever. <laughs> so when it's time, it's like almost like nine o'clock. I'm like, I'm sputtering out, starting to like lose it. And she's like, just go to bed now. Cause you know, you got to get up and do the thing super early in the morning. So I go down at like nine ish, 10 ish. And I'm back up at, I don't know, two. <laughs> one o'clock in the morning and I've been up ever since and we're going to go through the rest of the day. So those are the kinds of things that like, you know, we have to strategize because we still want to get these things done because we're in this together. We're pursuing this together. So we need to work together and um, it's working out. So big shout out to my wife. 
that's such like a positive um I love the way he's like strategize together like I love that such good teamwork like so cool yeah got to got to do it if we if we want what we want you know we we definitely share the 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 ideal philosophy is that you know we're stronger together we can do more together than we can individually and it's just a whole concept of synergy right one plus one can equal a thousand if you needed to so um that's that's where we come from that's so interesting and it's such an intentional way to go about what you want to do I find that so interesting because I don't know for me I don't think it sounds really makes me sound really lazy but I don't think I would have the motivation to like make myself get up at that time but I don't know maybe I should try it one day and see what happens Give it a shot, you know. Um, Kobe Bryant's the exact same way, you know. Rest in peace to Kobe. He uh would be up super early and get like way more practices in than everybody, and that's and he does that over time and compounds over time. He, he, people will be, he'll be so far ahead of anybody, like you couldn't you couldn't match him if you wanted to because he's he's invested so much time, and that philosophy really resonates with me because if I'm pumping out these high, higher quality videos and these tutorials and the stories and everything else that I'm doing on social media way earlier than anybody else is getting up. And most of my audience is in like the, on the West Coast. So I'm already three hours ahead of them. So if it's five o'clock in the morning over here, it's 2 a.m. over there. No one's up, and especially they're not creating content. Mm -hmm. So that gives me the edge. I do that for a week, a month, a year, three years. Like I'm, I'm going to be that guy. And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what, like, that's where the intention comes from. That's so interesting. Yeah, because I was talking to, I think it was uh, on one of my other, one of these videos, I think it was Marina Skew, I was talking to you about this. And I said to her, sometimes I feel like I need time to do nothing so the creative ideas can, like, come. Because sometimes when, because I, I am also, I feel a lot of the time in perpetual motion, Sometimes I feel if I don't stop, the ideas stop. They don't come. I don't know why. Mm, that's interesting. Um, for me, I, I pull inspiration from everything that I do. So for me, the ins it, it's not necessarily about like the creativity stops. It's like I don't have enough time to see, seek it out and to see it through. Like, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. What if I did this like this? Especially when we were talking about the videos earlier, you know, figuring out how you need to make the format. And there's just so much things that you need to learn because usually when there's big productions, there's a team. There's, like, people that do these things that we don't know about or care about. And if you're by yourself and you're a solo one-person show, you have to be everybody. So there's things that you have to learn. And when you learn a certain thing, like a camera angle, for example, like, oh, that would look good over here. What if I did the brioche hat and had a, an angle looking this way or something like that or using a different needle or something like that? Like the one that I have here, one second, since we're on the topic. Ugh. Like we'll take this brioche hat, for example, right? Like I did this on a plane <laughs> from Florida to to the states or not to the states to to back home um from florida back home and it it's a it's it's not a an actual it's not necessarily a design but it's just something that was in my head right so um what if i had a double brim for brioche and i inverted the color and i like the the flip side of the 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 hat or the the fabric and made that the body like who's showing people how to do that Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I could be that guy. I'm going to be that guy that shows people how to do something like that, because since it's folded, both sides of the, the brim are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But the outside, but the body would show what the inside would have been. So I get that duality still. Like, that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. And they're not showing that kind of stuff on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not doing it for free. Yeah. <laughs> that's so interesting. So, so that's super interesting to hear a little bit about 
the behind the scenes creative process. Um, I don't actually know anyone else in real life who would ever get up at that time to work. So I'm really intrigued and really interested to hear all about that process. So we'll just um, kind of go on to the next little question that I have, which is about your interest in Galway yarn. And Okay, let's go. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your experience with that fibre and yarn, um, because I know you've knit it a bit with it um, in the past. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So um, just going around, um, I'm really big into like, you know, the Aran sweaters, the Aran knits. So I got... I was thinking about wearing mine, but I'll show it. <laughs> so I got my uh, Aaron sweater here mm. I made yeah. and um, very, very excited about it. And just really interested in the, not necessarily the lore, because it's, it's actually real life, um, the history of, of Irish um, culture and like the fishermen wearing the sweaters and how they were handmade and the clans and the crests and things. Um, I'm, I was super, super interested in that and super interested in the wool that they had. And that's why, like, I would only really make all of my sweaters in the ruggedest type of wool. Because, you know, back in those times, even some places now, they don't have big box stores. They don't have pure new wool. They just have wool, <laughs> clean, washed wool with the in the greases, like they would say, in the greases. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm a fan. I'm a fan, a real fan. And, um... When I heard about Galway, just going through the internet and, and things like that, and like that being like a place where like, you know, a lot of native Irish, you know, heritage still resides, um, I just started like just going down the rabbit hole. And then I found Blanid, and then I found the Galway wool, and I was like, I'm in, I'm in, just get it to me, get me the yarn, let's let's make something happen. And next thing you know, we're talking, I'm talking at the same around same time with, with Blanid. And um, I'm getting a, a, a cone, giant cone of yarn, and um, I'm making a sweater with it right now. I made a couple of hats with it. Then we start going down the rabbit hole of like um, me figuring out that like I'm feeling the yarn and I'm like, this does not feel like it's in the greases. Like, I don't feel the grease. Where's the grease? I don't feel the grease. And she told me like, well, you know, in the big manufacturing process, they they, they take the, the, the lanolin out. And I was like, what <laughs> there's no way so i figure out how to put the lanolin back into the wool <laughs> you know and we we go down that whole little rabbit hole and now like you know i got like 15 bars of lanolin soap in my basement you know i've sold some of the stuff i've given out you know what i've done to to do that and you know from there it you just take the lie out and now it's a moisturizer you know i have that right where is it right here <laughs> you oh. know it's just the creative process and like where that stuff comes from and all of this started with one animal isn't that something one animal went all this way and did all these things and provided just those things externally and all of those kept the animal alive it's not even we're not even talking about food yet <laughs> you know it, and it's just such a it's such an amazing thing to to use that and like being able to teach our kids in the next generation like that's where all this stuff comes from. It didn't come from a machine. It didn't come from the postman. <laughs> it came from the earth. You know, it was you know a divine thing. So like that's what really piqued my interest in um, Galway and and all of that. And um, I'm very interested to see you know where else we go with that. I was in talks with you know, blah sometimes and some other person a couple of months ago, I haven't heard back from them yet, but I still um, promote whenever there's an opportunity to do so. That's really cool. Um, uh, I love the fact that you are into the whole story of the whole thing and the history, like that's really interesting to me as well. Um, so yeah, I guess, could you tell us a little bit about your experience of knitting with the yarn? Uh, like, how did you find that? Um, I know the yarn you have isn't mine, but I'll send you some. Um, <laughs> but it's the same uh, fiber. So I'd be interested to know how you found that experience of knitting with it. How did it compare to like other maybe breeds of um, like different breeds and different yarns that you've tried or just other yarns in general? Um, yeah. I actually have the cone right here, part of it. 
<laughs> so I'm still working on it mm -hmm. at this stuff. Um, it's definitely a different experience. And when I have that, it's not like a good or a bad or a better or worse because to, to compare something like that, you'd have to compare it in its own league. There has to be like another like, like league of, of heritage wolves, you know, and there's not very many of those. So um, it's almost like it's, it's, it's a bit of a league of its own. And when I put the landlin back into it, like I'm trying to, get like a, a pigeonhole view of like this is what the older lady outside of her house on the stone cobblestone street is just working on and it's wet and it's i'm trying to put myself in that atmosphere like this is this is what they had this is it <laughs> and um that is a a, a huge deal for me because you know like these are the bits of the past that this is all we got you know, and that's why there it's it's coveted so much because this th those those folks are not here anymore, and like we have this to remember them by. We have the the garments that they made to remember them by. Like that's all we have. Um, working with it definitely gives me like a it it's it, it's it's magical in in a sense. the The feel is rough. It's rugged. It's not something that's ne to to be next to skin. It's not a merino by any stretch. Um, but I don't think it should be judged that way. Mm. Um. It shouldn't be judged that way because, you know, fast fashion, the, the, the type of fashion that that's there, pe people, mostly consumers want things that are like soft to the skin. And, you know, they want it to feel like, you know, 10,000 threads, cotton, Pima cotton, satin, but it's made out of sheep. Um, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's made to keep you warm. It's 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 got a certain chemical biological makeup to stand withstand the weather. It stays warm even when it's wet. Cotton don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Just don't do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, sometimes it gets a bad rap, but I always want to make sure that like, I, I give the wool justice. It, it does what it's supposed to do. It kept the sheep warm. It kept the sheep dry. It kept the sheep from getting super sick because of the antimicrobial properties that Landlin has. Mm -hmm. So I love it for the things that it does. And I, and I recognize the things that it does and I recognize the things that it doesn't do. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It, I can't judge it on the things that it doesn't do. I judge it on the things that it can do and what it was made for and made by. Mm -hmm. So love me some more. <laughs> That's so interesting. I love how you described it as rugged. That's exactly how I would describe it. And I, I'm of a very similar thinking about it in a similar way to you. Like, I, yeah, it can't be judged with the Merino, the Blue Face Lesser. Like, it's a completely different thing. Um, yes. And people that usually buy my yarns are usually into that because that's mainly what I sell. But this is like, yeah, in a league of its own, like you said, like, this is a different thing, <laughs> even to what yeah. I so. so you mentioned really about um how the lanolin's taken out um during the spinning process um which i think probably has to do with dyeing the yarn as well as the spinning process because obviously for me as a dyer if i get clean yarn that's really good for me because i don't have to then scour it yep. um, but obviously like it changes the texture of the fiber yep. and that it becomes less waterproof or like a water resistant I suppose and mm -hmm. it really changes how it feels maybe how like yeah. soft it is or like maybe soft is the wrong word I can't think of the right word but um so can you tell me a little bit about your experiments with lanolin making lanolin um wool wash um and your moisturizer and um those kind of experiments and then adding it back to the fiber, like how did that change your finished object? Great. So um, it, I was going for the notion of how these older folks, you know, like the old tiny people would just, you know, card the wool, spin the wool, clean off the, sh like clean the wool, whatever, and leave it in the greases and then boom, your, your needles go. Ah, ah. Like I was looking for that. I was trying to get back to that. And since it didn't have that in there, so um, I go on the internet, I just start like, you know, Frankensteining different techniques together. And um, 
making the the lanolin wool wash, the soap, you know, using the lye and using all that kind of stuff. And I'd soak up, a, I'd suspend a bunch of it in water and then just put like a hat, like a finished object, just bam, just in there and just let it, um, you know, take it all in, take it all in. And once it dried, I did a video on it on Instagram, by the way, too. If you want to have a look at that, it's pretty funny. If you laugh, you win. That's what it's about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm dropping water on it and the water's like beating up. And mm-hmm. I'm getting excited. I'm like, oh, this is it. This is good. I like that. Go out in the rain and, you know, it's just beating off and, and things like that. Um, that was the, the the way that I always envisioned, you know, heritage wool, lanolin and the grises. And I, I envisioned it to be like that. So I'm, I was trying to recreate that whole vibe. And that was the wool wash. And um, there are a lot of people that are really like resonated towards the wool wash and, and things. And they were like, oh, can I like, do you sell it? And this and that. And, like I sold a few bars here and there. Um, didn't really make it in with the intention to sell, but, you know, they wanted to, you know, uh, make sure that, you know, my work was well compensated for. And I very much appreciated that. Um, and then with the moisturizer, um, I started just, I did everything the same. Just took the lie out because you don't want lie on your skin like that, right? <laughs> so um, then I worked that whole thing out, and um, it was very uh, the, the lanolin, like you know, if you if anybody's into smelling really sheepy, um, that's the stuff you want to have because <laughs> it smells really sheepy. Um, but I'm into that kind of like smell, you know. I definitely would love to go to Ireland one day and, and be out there, but. Those are the kind of experiments that like I did and I, you know, added some things and took some things out to, you know, make the moisturizer uh, what I wanted it to be. If I wanted more shine or if I wanted more, you know, skin penetration or if I wanted, you know, more uh, moisture barrier properties, you know, you can add or move around some things to, to make that work for you. If you want to add fragrance, you put some essential oils in there you're good to go. It's a lot of uh, creativity just in that aspect alone. And it was just a a mere branch of the sheep. So Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Yeah, because when I'm sorting like the fleeces from a clip, like your hands really get really lanolin-y. I mean, it's quite smelly, but definitely your hands are soft after my dad. He helps me like he always says like, oh, my hands are so soft now. Like, this is lovely. Um, yes but you do get stinking as well so yeah it's kind of an amazing product as well uh as sheep can produce wool they also produce this lanolin which is so cool you do classes i do i do um if you go to my my link tree in my bio on instagram you can see the flyer that i have Mm -hmm. and i do one-on-one um classes so my one-on-one classes they're very different from a lot of what, what people would think a one-on-one class would be. It Like a lot of people think that you would bring your knitting and I would just sit there. Yep. Nope. Nope. You got yarn over right there. Nope. You got to Nope. Nope. That's not going to write. Nope. You got to do it like this. Nope. Well, tell me what your gauge is. Like, that's what they think it is. And it's totally not like that. <laughs> so say somebody like, say you were to book with me and you're like, Hey, Willie, I want to do brioche. I'm like, okay. Great. Do you have a pattern? Do you have a pattern that you're working on? No, I just want to learn the technique. Okay, great. Well, here's this free pattern that I have on Ravelry. It's about a hat. Do you want to make the hat? Do you want to start the hat? And we can do that. And you're like, yeah, great. So the thing that I do is I make it with you. Right there with you. You tell me what kind of yarn you have. You tell me what, and I'll match it up the best I can with what I have in my studio. And um, I have the camera equipment and like, I'll put the boom arm over here. So it has the overhead view. So you can see my hands going and you can see everything real time because, excuse me, that's what YouTube has done for us. I create that experience just live. And you don't have to stop, put your knitting down and hit pause or play. You can just say, hey, stop right there. Go back. Mm -hmm. What did you do? You can interact with a human. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? I love it. So that's what my classes are about. And um, <clears throat> yes, it goes an hour, but if we're vibing and we're going and, you know, we need to get this thing done, I'm going to go until it's done. Right. 
but you got you have to put a finite time on things to get a rate. I get that. But when it comes to creativity and potential, we get it done until we go until it's done. Mm-hmm. And when it's done, we're happy. I have not had one, and I pat myself on the back on this one. I don't do that very often, but I have not had a single person, client, say that they walked away without their problem being solved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I haven't heard of any other um, knitwear or like knit and designer teacher who offers that as a really unique offer, and actually. I, I think it is too, you know, and um, I, I don't have as many offerings as I thought I would because I guess I don't necessarily advertise it mm-hmm. um, like that because um, when you think about it, like I'm, I'm a big numbers guy too and like um, sales and business and things like that because you got to be, right? Um, if there's, a, if there's a, a, a way that someone can learn on their own without spending a dime, then they're going to, that, that option is very viable especially with folks who like or who don't feel like they can afford it or is out of their price range or or whatever the case <clears throat> whatever the case may be because and then you have the other set of folks is like I don't care what it costs I want to learn this thing and I don't want it to take forever and I need some a person to show me mm-hmm. those are my people <laughs> those mm-hmm. are my people right mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that the people that just want to watch YouTube videos all day can't cross over because I still love you. Come on over, right? It's all love. Um, it's just that, you know, some people know how to, I guess, equate what their time is worth mm-hmm. to them. And mm-hmm. some people just just see money. Yeah. And there's that too. Mm-hmm. Neither one are good or bad. It's just who they are. Mm-hmm. And I'm just here to work with a lot of folks because you start to see that when people are like, hey, do a tutorial on this, do a tutorial on this. And it's just like the one person that wants the one thing. Oh, I know. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. Oh, dear. You know, and that's why I put up polls and things, you know, yes. like, what do you think we should do? Um, and then if there's like a vast majority of people that want to learn how to do this toe up thing or learn how to do brioche, that's why I did the whole brioche hat um, mm-hmm. series. Like that that free hat that I was telling you about, like I did a whole series on it because there were so many people that wanted that. So I'm not going to put that behind a paywall. Mm-hmm. We're going to learn it together, mm-hmm. right? So that's what it's all about. That's really cool. So I'm kind of interested to hear, because obviously you're like a maths, mathematics guy. Mm-hmm. And yes. you have a brain for business. So what what kind of does your... What does your business look like? Obviously, you have the teaching, you have your Instagram. So how, how do you kind of put all those things together? And like, how, what, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to ask, but like. <laughs> Make something out of it. Like, yeah. how, do you, how, like how, do you, how do you thrive as a business with all of these different things, right? Totally yeah. get it. Because I'm, I'm thinking about it every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> um because I let my vision guide me, right? Um, my vision is to be in a community where people can make what they want through skill set. You can make what you want. In knitting, when you know how to do the things you need to do, you can make it look however you want it to look. So mm-hmm. I don't sell products per se, right? I sell services. Like I said, I sell hope, I sell dreams, I sell potential. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's what people want and that's what people already have. Mm -hmm. So um, Mm -hmm. I partner with a lot of businesses because, um, and and, and I do a lot of promotion. So I promote things. I only promote things that I believe my audience can benefit from. I've said no more times than I've said yes. Um, I'm I've I'm partnered with Madeline Tosh, great yarn company, big yarn company. We, We share the same values, darn good yarn, share the same values promote a lot of folks like Clinton Hill Cashmere. Those are, you know, great businesses to promote and to be around, but it's, it's multiple things. And um, one day, hopefully I keep doing this and there's some value that's seen and I can partner with a company and do this full time um, or do something in the media or something like that. But it's, it comes from multiple ways. It's like you said, the Instagram, the, the teaching, the promotion, 
um, the the affiliates, the, the 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 paid partnerships, all of those kinds of things, to going out, doing events, speaking. Those those there's like that, there's like seven things, and you put all of those things together. I'm going to be able to create a living for my family just off that. That's really cool. You must have a good business plan. I, I believe I do. It's just uh, execution. <laughs> That's yeah. what it's about. <laughs> well done. I mean, you're talking to a woman who doesn't have a business plan. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that, but like if me and you got together, we could be some sort of force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> We're going the same way. Like there's, there's no such thing as, as competition. You're a yarn dyer, right? We need each other, yeah. right? You, me, the designers. I always tell myself, like you know, like I'm nestled in the middle between people who don't know how to do the thing and the designers that want to sell to the people that have the money to do their things, that want to do their things. I'm nestled right in the middle, and as they cross paths with me, little coins just drop into my pocket. <laughs> It's great. So um, I'm just helping people, right? Like I can't lose yeah. if I have this kind of attitude that I have towards everything yeah. that's going on. Like, how can I lose? Like who, who loses? No one, right? You exchange money with me, you get exactly what you were advertised to get, <laughs> you know? So that's what it's about. That's so cool. I find your attitude so refreshing i love it like i love that so cool can you tell us where you can where we can find you on the internet if people want to keep in touch with you please for sure i appreciate it um my uh instagram is willy nilly knits so w-i-l-l-i-e-n-i-l-l-i-e-k-n-i-t-s um that's on instagram all one word um it's just my logo you won't see my face it's just a white logo with the black lettering with the goat in the middle um, YouTube, same thing, Willy Nilly Knits, but it's Willy Nilly and then Space Knits. So you can see me there. Um, there's a little bit of life stuff, more vlogging type stuff on YouTube. Still working on um, trying to get that. Still trying to work on, you know, getting big enough to where I have a team because editing sucks and it takes forever. So um, trying to get that off of my plate. Um, but those are the bigger places that I am. Um, you can find me on TikTok as well, Black Miss Frizzle. So that's me. Love the name. Um, and those are the, the big three um, as of now. Um, I'm not very active on Facebook. Um, Instagram is the bigger, uh, the bigger place uh, where I reach people and where people can reach me. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that kind of wraps up all the questions I had. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and I'll put all the links um, to where we can find you in the description. And yeah, thanks so much for joining me, Willie. Thanks so much for having me. I'll get up at any hour for, for any folks in Ireland. So it's all about. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to mention one more thing that you might be interested in to look up. Um, after I finished recording with Willie, we continued talking um, and we were chatting about um, spinning in the grease. And I said, um, have you seen this documentary on YouTube that was originally put out by RTE? Um, and it shows a woman using fat of some description um, when she's spinning. So I managed to track that down and find it. And Willie said, yeah, he thought he'd seen that one. So um that's pretty cool and i think you'd enjoy it too so i'm going to link it below for you um there's a whole series um i think they came out in maybe the 60s or 70s maybe on rte and now they're on youtube so you can check that out and it just gives you a little glimpse into life in ireland several decades ago As always, thanks for tuning in and until next week, you're getting a bonus episode this month. Um, I'm not sure whether it'll be under Thinking Through Megan or a different title, but we're going to be talking to Blonid Gallagher um, of the Galway Wool Co-op. So hope you enjoy that and thanks for joining me. Bye.